Today we are going to uh, continue with the uh, parable I threatened you with earlier. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but he saw the man lying there, and he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. The temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, Yes, now go and do the same. Here is the reading. All right, well, uh, is there one more slide on there? There it is. There's the word, splagnitome, right? How hard is that to say? And we're, we're going to get to that in a minute, so hang on to that. Here we have a parable with a lot going on, not the least of which is that word right there. And this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, this is a parable that Jesus tells in response to a specific question. The verses leading up to the passage, Jesus is in a conversation with a group of Pharisees, and they're talking about, well, what's the most important command in all the laws of Moses? And Jesus then quotes to the Pharisee, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 6, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, and he tells the man that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay, so that's Jesus' answer. Well, the Pharisee doesn't challenge Jesus on loving God. We, he kind of accepts that. But he does decide to challenge Jesus on, hmm, love my neighbor. The Pharisee asks, well, who is my neighbor? And I'm going to need you to keep that question in mind because that question is central to the lesson that Jesus wants to use the parable of the Good Samaritan to teach. Because if it's, if it's that important that we love our neighbor, then we probably should know who that person is. Because if the entire law is going to be boiled down to these simple commands, you know, love God and love your neighbor, then who that neighbor is is going to be pretty important because we want to make sure we get that one right. If it's one of the top two. And that's where the Pharisees' challenge comes from. So who is this mysterious neighbor that I'm supposed to love? And Jesus, according to the Gospel of Luke, gives no other answer besides this parable. So let's introduce the characters, okay? In the, in the parable, you, you've got the bandits. You've got the man who gets beat up. You've got the priest, the temple assistant, and, of course, the Good Samaritan. These are the characters. Who is the neighbor, according to this passage? And even the Pharisee has to admit that the neighbor ends up being the person who the wounded man was helped by, okay? So the wounded man's neighbor was the Samaritan. Again, that's pretty obvious by how the parable goes. Not, not a big shock there. But we need to take a moment to appreciate the parable. We today call it the parable of the Good Samaritan, but that's not what Jesus calls it. Jesus calls the Samaritan the despised Samaritan. Now, thankfully, that name didn't catch on. I mean, the parable of the despised Samaritan doesn't have the, the same ring to it. Well, we know the title of the parable, but Jesus did not begin this parable by announcing the title of it, saying, I am now going to proclaim to you the parable of the Good Samaritan. No one knew until the parable went all the way through that it was going to end up with the Samaritan being the good guy. In fact, to the Jews listening, if Jesus would have said, you know, I'm going to tell you the parable of the Good Samaritan, they'd have been like, I'm out. They would have left because they're not ever going to believe anything as radical as there actually being something good about a Samaritan. Even the disciples would have struggled with that one because the Samaritans were hated by most of society. Now, in our modern culture today, a lot of people will tell you that racism was invented by America. I'm going to tell you that simply was not true. And in this parable, Jesus is playing on the racism of the Pharisees that he's talking to. Because that's how the story goes. You know, there was a man, 
He was beat up by bandits, uh, apparently robbed, left for dead along the road. Two men passed by. There was a priest and an assistant. I'm going to say more about them in a moment. And then Jesus says these words. Then a despised Samaritan comes along. And every Jew in the crowd believed, oh boy, this just went from bad to worse. You know, as bad as the situation would have been with the man lying there along the road having been beat up, as bad as it was at that point, it was about to get worse because now there's a Samaritan here. Just the presence of a Samaritan was worse than the bandits who beat the guy up in the first place. It was even worse than the two religious leaders who decided to allow the guy to die there, leave the guy there to die along the road. The crowd that Jesus was speaking to hated Samaritans so much that when the Samaritan climbs down the ditch with the wounded man, the Jews thought that's the worst thing that happened to him. Because you know those Samaritans. You know what they're like. And when Jesus went to the part of the parable where the Samaritan went into the ditch and started helping the man, the response of the Jews listening would have been, yeah, right, yeah, right. Having the Samaritan to be the one who actually helped the man, making him the good guy, that would have been the twist ending to the parable that no one would have believed was coming. Now, they would have had no problem believing in bandits who were robbing people. In fact, that was kind of a regular occurrence. You know, they would have believed that the two temple workers who passed this poor guy by, you know, that would have been exactly what they were expected to do. But a Samaritan helping? Come on, Jesus. But let's take a moment and answer another question, okay? We're going to come back to these other guys Talk about the priest and the assistant for just a second who passed the wounded guy up. So the priest comes along. He sees the man in the ditch. The guy's been beat up. Now remember, the priest, this road that they're on is between Jericho and Jerusalem. So chances are the priest is on his way back to Jerusalem, which means that he and the assistant were both on their way to the temple. To come into contact with this man's blood would have made them unable to enter the temple for a prescribed amount of time. Now even worse... If they got down in the ditch to where this wounded guy was and found out he was dead, or if the man was wounded so badly that he died while they were trying to help him, that would have kept him out of the temple even longer. <coughs> so the priest and the assistant, you know, they were there on some kind of official business in some capacity. I don't know exactly what, but that's what they were there for. So for them to make themselves unable to serve in the temple would have been a great hindrance to what they were trying to do. Now, we can only speculate as to what those duties might have been, but to come into contact with this wounded man and this possibly dead man represented a risk they were not willing to take. So the priest glances down at the wounded man. He quickly moves over to the other side of the road, moves right on. But Jesus also tells us the assistant struggled. You see, the assistant would not have had as much clout in the temple as the priest would have. You know, he would probably have been a younger man, you know, a trainee of some kind. And his duties and responsibilities of the temple would have been limited. Now, we aren't told this, but it's likely that the priest and the assistant were traveling together. And the priest, who very quickly decides, I'm not getting involved in this, he turns and warns his protege that he was not getting involved in this either. So to answer the question from the attendance sign-in sheet, did the priest and the assistant do the right thing? According to the law and the customs, they did do the right thing. They did exactly what they were supposed to do by not contaminating themselves with whatever the situation was in the ditch. They maintained their purity, and they were eligible to serve in the temple. That's exactly what they were supposed to do. See, though, this is where we have to remind ourselves. What was the original question? See, the question that Jesus was answering was not who was right. The question the Pharisee asked to prompt Jesus to tell this terrible parable was not who is right, he asked, who is my neighbor? Now, this is not a question of who is right here. The discussion is, what does it mean to be a neighbor to somebody? Who is this neighbor I'm supposed to love, wonders the Pharisee. Now, the priest and the assistant chose to lo love God that day by following the law. They were not there that day to love their neighbor. They prioritized God, and I mean, when you put it that way, kind of tough to blame them for the choice that they made. But the Samaritan had no such constraints. I mean, first, he obviously was not going to serve in the temple. He wasn't even allowed in the temple. If he even tried to get in the temple, even under the best of circumstances, 
Let's just say something really bad would have happened to him. You know, the Jews did not want him there. And he knew better to even attempt to get into the temple. You see, the Samaritans are people who had one Jewish parent and one Gentile parent. That's why the Jews hated them, because their very being, right down to their DNA, reeked of contamination. But the fact that the Samaritan was not getting into the temple under any circumstances meant that he had no reason not to help the wounded man. At least he didn't have the same reason that the priest and the assistant had. The priest and the assistant had a reason not to get involved. The Samaritan did not. Okay, we got that far. But even though there was, you know, there was nothing keeping the Samaritan out of the ditch, you know, just because there was no good reason for him not to go down and help that man doesn't mean the Samaritan is automatically going to help out either. Something had to happen to give the Samaritan reason to get off his horse and save this man's life. Okay, so he didn't have a reason not to, but also up to this point, we didn't have a reason that he would have gotten down the ditch. And Jesus tells us what that motivation was to save this man in verse 33. And there is a word in the original language of verse 33, and in Greek, the word is splagnitome. And I'm probably not even saying that right, but that's the word right there. When the Samaritans saw the man, splagnitome happened. That word happened. What does that word mean? That word means he felt compassion. He felt something toward this man he apparently did not know. He had a strong feeling, and that strong feeling was motivated him to get off his horse, climb in the ditch, and save this man's life by carrying him out of the ditch, putting him on his own horse, and carrying him to the hospital where he was nursed back to health. The point that Jesus is making is that the priest and the assistant, they had a reason to suppress their splagnitzame. They had a reason not to do that. Their obligation to the temple crushed their splagnitzame and caused them to pass the man by. The parable of the Good Samaritan challenges us because the reason that the priest and the reason that the assistant did not experience splagnitzame, it may have been a good reason, but was it a good enough reason to be worth the man in the ditch losing his life? The priest and the assistant talked themselves out of helping because they had greater obligations. But were those obligations worth the death of this wounded man? That's the question. What is splagnitzame? It is the God-given gift to passionately do the right thing. The Samaritan had no reason not to help the wounded man. And given the reputation of Samaritans and how much everybody hated them, nobody expected this guy to do anything but go make sure everything was robbed off the body. But that reputation did not matter to the Samaritan. Because he saw a situation he could take control of, and he did. The Samaritan took control, and he determined what happened here. Because of the intervention of the Samaritan, the wounded man lived. Splagnitzame is the passion to take control, or at least contribute to, the outcome of a situation. So when was the last time you were a good Samaritan? When was the last time you felt that, that well of feelings that comes up from your gut? And suddenly, you're willing to draw a line in the sand to take control of a situation and make the outcome be something different than it was going to be. Because we actually have a word for splagnitzame today. We have a, actually, it's not a word, it's a phrase. The phrase is, saving the day. When was the last time you saved the day? See, there are some days and some situations where we have to be the priest or the assistant. You know, we have no welling of feelings up inside of us. And that's God's signal that that particular day is not yours to save. That day, in the parable, it was not the priest's or the assistant's day to save. That day was the Samaritan's day to save. And he felt the strong emotion and he made a decision. And the decision the Samaritan made was... This man will not die if I can help it. That was the decision he made. I firmly believe that we have more opportunity to save the day than we realize. But far too often, we decide to be the priest. Or we decide to be the assistant. You know, we're not the ones who are going to get involved. When that 
may not necessarily be the case. You see, if God puts a burning desire in your heart, that means you have the chance to do something about something that you see. Now, you may not save the whole world, but you could save the world for one person. And do you know what a privilege it is to save the day for someone? To directly contribute to the improving of someone else's world. Sure, some days may need to pass by because it's not your day to save. But before you leave that situation, lying there bleeding in the ditch like the priest and the assistant did, you better make sure that you're going to be able to live with that situation that you did nothing to change. Because that was the original question. The Pharisee asked, who is my neighbor? The answer is, your neighbor is the person who needs you. I don't know what they need from you, but there are people in your world who need your intervention. They're heading toward a very negative outcome because of their circumstances, and you may have the chance to give that person a different tomorrow. If you're not moved to splagnitzame, then you have decided that you're okay with the outcome that's going to happen. You see, the priest and the assistant decided that this man's death is okay with me because I have greater obligations. They may, not have, they may have done what was right according to the law, but even the Pharisee who was speaking with Jesus had to admit that leaving the man in the ditch indicated the priest and the assistant did not care what happened to him because they had a good excuse. Splegnit to me. The God-given gift of preventing a bad outcome. It's the most powerful action you can ever take toward anything. The chance to, again, at least contribute to a better outcome to a situation than simply allowing that situation to play out in the worst way possible. Way too often, I think we convert our passion to do something into something passive. We convert our passion to do something into things that we complain about. Uh, Things are just not the way they used to be. And this situation is pathetic, and I can't believe these people let this happen. And every day we see these things... But we don't take advantage of the clear gift that God gives us to change some of those things. To move in such a way that we can make something different happen than what we see is obviously going to go wrong. To build relationships and to intervene with someone to help a situation get back on track. We pass those opportunities up. Why? The priest and the assistant, they had a great reason to let this man die. They were going to serve in the temple. They passed their opportunity to be a neighbor to this man because they had a good excuse. That was their reason. They just left it go. So in closing this morning, let me ask you this question. How good does an excuse not to act have to be in order to make it be okay to do nothing? How good does it have to be? I don't know the answer to that. You know, what did Jesus think of the excuse the priest and the, leave, er, the priest and the assistant gave? What did he think of that? I don't know. He doesn't say. And I'm not going to speculate as to what Jesus thought about it. But, and you all know this really well here this morning, at one time or another, we all have been the guy in the ditch. We have been the one who needed help at one time or another. We may have been overwhelmed. We may have been wounded. We may have been hurt. We may have been in over our heads. And to all of the people who passed by in that moment and didn't do anything, what excuse would you accept? See, the man in the ditch, he couldn't have cared less about the temple. He wanted somebody to help him. And the excuse is always good enough for the person who's making it. But how does that excuse sound to the one who actually needs help? Splagnitzame, the passion to change the outcome to a situation. Friends, if our world is going to be saved, we're going to have to stop making excuses, and we're going to have to do this. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.